to the casual observer, rock fishing appears to be incredibly dangerous. And in some ways, the statistics back this up. I mean, every year, Sunday fishermen are washed off the rocks to their deaths. And of course, you have to ask yourself, just what is it that attracts people to risk life and limb just for a feed of fish? Now, this article, published in 1905 in the Sydney Morning Herald, goes some way to describing the attraction of rock fishing. But as well as that, it gives us a bit of an insight into our changing attitude towards danger. Everyone is known to his sorrow, some brim enthusiast. He drags one into an alley, away from the ebb and flow of the city traffic. The fish are biting, he says with a husky undertone, at. And here his voice falls to a whisper, and he glances around, uneasily. Middle Harbour. But the blackfisher disposes with all this cheap melodrama to stand with the water of mid-July up to one's knees and splashing upon one's chest hour after hour requires a certain kind of pluck which is not found in all men. And as many of the rocks are slippery with sea scum and weed, there is always the chance that your name will figure in the morning papers. Drowned at. But the exhilaration of danger only adds the last touch of fascination to the sport of blackfishing. Now in order to really understand what the allure of these wave-soaked rocks is all about, we have to really look at the culture of just one fish. Now, of course, many different types of fish are caught off the rock ledges, but there's one fish in particular that is synonymous with rock fishing and the attraction of rock fishing. Hello, my name's John Morell, and I want to tell you the story of the humble blackfish. Now, you might think to yourself, blackfish, that doesn't sound very interesting, but this is a fascinating story. And it takes us all the way back to the streams of 1860s Britain right through the colonial days, through the depression and into the future. Now the blackfish is an ocean fish predominantly found along the east coast of Australia from southern Queensland right down into Tasmania but it's also found in South Australia and Western Australia. But it's most common on the east coast between say Queensland and Gippsland in Victoria. Now for me the blackfish story doesn't start on the coast. The first time I ever went fishing my father Ted Morell took me fishing on the aptly named Fish River. Now, I'll never forget that experience. We were crossing these dry brown paddocks and suddenly we were in this magnificent river environment. Um, cool of the willows and crystal clear water flowing over the rocks with untold mysteries beneath the surface. And that morning, with my dad's help, I caught two rainbow trout. And of course, I was hooked for life. For a large part of my adult life, I lived in inland Australia and only fished for trout. Now, about 12 years ago, I came back to coastal fishing, and all I really wanted to catch is blackfish. Well, this is looking perfect today. We've just got some nice wash coming out of these rocks here, and my guess is there'll be a few nice fish sitting in that murky water right there. Out here, as I look, I can see hundreds of blackfish just curling in the waves and washing off the rocks. So, let's see how we go. I grew up fishing on the south coast, on Lake Illawarra. And we fished for all sorts of fish, we fished for the standard estuary species. We fished for brim, flathead, whiting, but it was the blackfish that captured my imagination. Now, I'm still not a very good black fisherman, but one day I'll get there. But what I found while I was fishing for blackfish was what seems to be a bit of a cult. There are a group of people out there that only fish for blackfish. Whoop, yep, we're on. Oh, nice fish out wide. Now sure, there are other fish that have a dedicated angling following, such as trout. But blackfish is unique on the East Coast in that it's one of those rare coastal fish that attracts a cult-like following.
There we go. That's what it's all about. Beautiful blackfish. Stripes down the side, quite light in colour. Very good size in that one. We'll put him in the net, keep him for dinner. Best looked after in the keeper net. Keep them nice and fresh. And if you don't want to take them home, put them back in the ocean. So I thought to myself, what is this all about? What is it about the blackfish that attracts such passion? So I thought I'd go on a bit of a journey and find out. And along the way, I talked to some of these people that were passionate about their blackfishing. And the story that emerged was far more than just a story about a fish. This story took me to the coarse streams, the roach streams of England in the 1860s. And it took me to Captain Cook in the early days of the Sydney Cove. Um, where without fish, survival would have been very difficult. And it's taken me through the hardship of the depression. But as well as that, it's exposed me to the incredibly strong bonds that exist between predominantly fathers and sons and the importance of mentoring in modern society. So this is the journey I took and these are the people I met. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope it answers the question of what it is about the blackfish. Blackfish, or ludric, as was the Aboriginal name, which is the correct, uh, the correct Australian term for the fish, um, uh, is very, very strongly built. And certainly blackfish have, have worn different names up and down the, the coast for years. Uh, most fishermen who fish for ludric still call them blackfish. In, in previous, less enlightened times, there were all sorts of nicknames that they were given. And remember that I'm going back to a time where um, uh, the use of terms like darky and nigger were still being used in Australia. Um, but these days, most serious ludric anglers, I think, still talk about blackfish. Um, but, you know, when we're being correct in writing articles or whatever, we'll talk about ludric fishing, definitely. We refer to the blackfish as the ludric. Uh, they have other colloquial names, but the ludric is the preferred name. You know, it's the flash of genius that's got me intrigued. That's that light bulb moment when there's a whole new invention. And I've become fascinated with just what that moment was with the blackfish. Now, this hunt was primarily triggered by stories that I heard about fishermen at the turn of the last century in Fairlight in Sydney and they were reported to be using centipin reels, long rods and floats to catch blackfish. Now that equipment is used on the coarse streams of England. Now in order to determine whether there was a link and when it might have come about, I had to go right back through the available archival material. And I followed two particular trails. One of those trails was the equipment of course, and the other trail was the bait. The equipment I'm using here today, centipin reel, long rod, float and greenweed. Now this equipment, and this is the really interesting part, this equipment can be traced right back to the coarse streams of England in the 1800s. Well in the early days uh, we were dependent on, on wooden reels which came from England and we followed the English tradition of using what they called the Nottingham reel because this, this reel was invented in Nottinghamshire by a man by the name called Slater. Now this form of fishing split off from fly fishing in the 1800s. Now there was one figure in particular that was really instrumental in the development of, this, of, of the use of this type of equipment, commonly known as roach fishing or coarse fishing in England. 
and his name was J.W. Martin. Now he wrote a book called The Nottingham Style of Float Fishing and Spinning. Now he went out of his way to introduce working class people to this style of fishing because he claimed in his book that he himself was a working class man. And one of the big things that inhibited people's development in fishing back in that era was the fact that they not only couldn't afford the equipment, but they couldn't afford the books, they couldn't afford to learn how to fish. So J.W. Martin in his seminal work made sure that people had access to information. And the practice of using porcupine quills as floats came to us from English tradition where they were used on, on English river fishing and they that, I believe, is how this system started in Australia, by English expatriates bringing out uh, some of their English river fishing gear and trying it for blackfish. Now, if we go back further than J.W. Martin, there was a chap called W.B. Lord. Now, this is very interesting. Bear with me here. Now, he was a veterinary surgeon that served in the Crimean War. Now, when he came back from that war, he wrote quite a few books. And one of those books was called Sea Fish and How to Catch Them. Now, what he talked about in that book was a fish called the grey mullet. Now, mullet and blackfish have a lot in common. And most particularly, they've both been, always been a very affordable fish. But there's another thing that they have in common too, which a lot of people don't know about. What W.B. Lord said about the grey mullet was that they floated around in tidal estuaries and they ate greenweed, and that was the term he used. Greenweed, which grew on the rocks, which grew on the logs, which grew on the piers. And what he said was that you got this greenweed and you wrapped it two or three times around the hook and let the tail hang down, which is exactly what we do today on the east coast of Australia. And of course prior to that, settlers had arrived in Australia and they were very dependent upon fish to feed themselves, to feed the early colony. Now the first reference I can find to the blackfish is a drawing by colonial marine artist Dr James Stewart. Now the actual date of the drawing is not clear, but it was drawn between 1839 and 1842. Now there's no name on the drawing, but it is quite definitely a blackfish. Now it's no coincidence that the Reverend J.E. Tennyson Woods in 1882 wrote a book called Fish and Fisheries of New South Wales. Now Tennyson Woods was an educationist, a scholar, a preacher and a prolific author. And he was the first one to record the fact that blackfish could be caught on this equipment, on centre pin reels, on long rods, but most particularly on greenweed. This timeline is not evidence of anything, it's not proof of anything, but it's very compelling to think that somewhere in Sydney Harbour, someone knew about the grey mole and the fact that they ate greenweed, and they saw the blackfish floating around in the tidal pools, eating the greenweed off the rocks and the logs. And they put two and two together and went, I might give that greenweed a bit of a go. And the rest, as they say, is history. Oh, yep, we're on. Oh, oh, keep you out of those trees. It's a lot of structure down there for this fish to get into. Oh, this is a good fish. These fish in this crystal clear water, fantastic black fishing. They come out almost silver, silvery white. Beautiful blackfish. Very hard to describe, uh, <clears throat> you know, the exact reasons why you fish for blackfish and why you, why you, uh, you know, why you don't fish for for all kinds of other fish. I mean, I have fished for other fish uh, at times. There's the old uh, adage that. Uh, when you catch a fish, uh, you don't actually catch a fish, the fish catches you. 
And I probably one of my most vivid fishing memories is a 15 year old uh, fishing at the, uh, uh, there was a fisherman's wharf opposite where I grew up uh, in suburban Wollongong in Berkeley. And I went down uh, with my brother who was, uh, who was a fisherman and I hadn't really fished much apart from uh, drifting for flathead with my dad on the lake. But I have this memory of, I think it was early morning and you'd, you'd put your float in a small amount of water, I suppose, you know, foot, foot by foot by foot kind of pyramid. And I just, to this day, I remember the excitement of that float going down, the, just sitting there watching the float and thinking, you know, how dull is this? And then bang, the float just disappears. And, and the excitement of that, I mean, I think, as I said, it's, it, I have quite a few fishing memories, but probably none more vivid than that. Probably, you know, just simply the reason why I've, I, I've always come back to it and, uh, because the blackfish hooked me. Often uh, when I talk to mates about fishing and they say, oh, I love going fishing, I love, you know, love sitting there and, you know, just sort of, it's a great meditation. And uh, <laughs> um, blackfishing is a kind of a meditation, but it's, uh, it requires a great deal of concentration uh, because you are forever watching your float. Sometimes you get the faintest little hook up and I just hooked him up in the corner of the mouth there. So that's why I, uh, that's why you don't force the issue and uh, try and drag him in. You know, the history of black fishing is that it's a little bit like people's uh, veggie patch. Very much a working class tradition uh, that a bloke would always have uh, a, uh, a veggie patch so that you the family would if, if, if there was a meal on um, it would be you know the duty to go out and get the greens from the veggie patch you wouldn't buy greens it was unheard of and in, in and for someone who was a fisherman you wouldn't buy fish either completely unheard of the ordinary bloke in the street was going off black fishing which he could do he could he, it was his, it was an art and he could do it um, at the same time or early, much earlier People in a different social strata, the, uh, they used to say that you could never find a barrister after about the 20th of December because they, they'd all packed up their, their trout rods and were headed off down into the snowy. Blackfishing in its essence is similar to, uh, to dry or wet fly fishing for trout. And um, it's rather interesting. I, I believe that to be true. I believe, for instance, the blackfish is a better fighter than a trout. A trout is a good aerialist, but he won't fight for the length of time that a blackfish will fight by any, any degree. We fish for blackfish in the rivers and lakes as, a, as opposed to fishing for them on the sea walls. The way we fish for them, they're a challenge. It's, uh, I sort of feel it's a saltwater version of the trout. With trout fishing, you're looking for lies where the trout will be holding, you know, in low pressure areas in streams, uh, and uh, try and put your fly or your nymph there. And that's very much like, uh, it's a very similar situation here because the blackfish lie in the low pressure behind the weed and uh, where there's no effort for them to stay, and then they'll dart out and take the bait and then move back into the low pressures again. But of course, as you might expect, in the early 1900s, class was very important. And this comparison, which was made between black fishing and trout fishing, right back into the 1800s, was vehemently denied in the Sydney Morning Herald. On the 8th of November, 1911, there's an article about this very issue. Estuary black brimmers and fine liners for blackfish need not waste time instituting comparisons between their forms of the sport and fly fishing for trout. These branches of angling are as wide apart as golf is from cricket or football from lawn tennis. pretty big part of my life is blackfish and I probably would fish four times a week I guess and we got we got well very very lucky here at Brunswick because we got so many options well I got hooked on black fishing when I came up about 12 years ago uh, I didn't know anything about blackfish and um, when I came up I came down onto this little rock wall down here 
And when I come down, I just come down with a brim rod just to catch brim or flathead or whatever was in the water. But uh, when I got down there, I seen a lot of a lot of these old guys. They were all sitting around the wall, sitting on a rock. And I had a look in. I could see all the floats there, and I, I didn't have a clue what they were fishing for. So I just observed them for a while, and I soon found out what they were fishing for. And I, I sort of looked, I liked the look of it, and um, I sort of had a go at this black fishing myself, and um, haven't fished for anything else since. <laughs> Just a, it's just an unusual form of fishing, you know, it's, it's really, as you know, you, you use a float and you only use a float for basically catching mullet and uh, blackfish up here at Brunswick Heads. And oh, it's, it's just got into my system and I'm hooked on it. <laughs> Two baits that we collect up here in the Brunswick River is um, one called Horsehair, we call it, the lo all the locals here call it horsehair. And the other one that grows on the rocks, pretty well in the same area, you can either pick horsehair or you pick your cabbage. friend of uh, mine in my life, an older chap, when he found out that I was a black fisherman, he used to tell me about his um, uncles who were gun fishermen who uh, were so keen to get the best spot by the harbour that they would, uh, in their three-piece uh, suits at work in the waistcoat pocket, they would have their green weed. Even though they feed on green weed predominantly, uh, almost exclusively, um, the weed varies from place to place. Fishing up north you'll find uh, the blokes up there swear by this weed that grows in the cane fields. There we are. Oh, oh. That's it. Now that is brilliant. It's obviously some uh, nutrient rich weed that grows in the canals in between the, the sugar cane fields what they call the Bondi Merc and the Malamar Merc and the Bluefish Merc were all pumping untreated sewage straight into the water off the coast. Weed and cabbage and all those species of, of, uh, of algae just proliferated. You could pick bait anywhere uh, and it was all the phosphate. It's just like fertilising a field. In the 30s and 40s, Enterprising entrepreneurs would sell green weed in the city, and in fact, the trams going from the Sydney CBD to Central Station would make an unscheduled stop in the haymarket so that the blackfish fishermen could hop off, buy their weed, and hop back on again. And in the Depression, uh, your, the blackfish weed was bought at the fish shop. Green weed was gathered in Botany Bay, and it was sent by rail all over the uh, north coast. You know there's two main types of bait. There's the cabbage, which you get off the rocks, and there's the green weed, which is much harder to come by. And there are days when the blackfish will only take the green weed. And of course, to find the green weed, you've got to know someone, because to the black fisherman, it's a bit of a secret. In fact, green weed can be sometimes like gold. One of the places that the green weed grows incredibly well is these phosphate-rich prawn farms on the north coast. But unlike the 1930s when the green weed was shipped from Parramatta and Botany Bay all up and down the coast, it's actually the reverse. So now what you find is that the local fishing tackle shops will send the green weed from here, possibly as far as Sydney, but from here to various destinations up and down the coast. We send a lot um, into Queensland, southern Queensland and northern New South Wales. But most guys reckon they can keep it to probably four weeks. But once, once you get infected with the bug, um, you, really do, uh, you really do salivate over a good bit of green weed. It's amazing. Uh, sometimes it's uh, just as uh, thrilling to uh, find a good patch of weed as it is to, uh, to get into a serious, uh, serious patch of fish. Uh, 
actually started uh, to fish for black fishing in the 1930s. And uh, this was in the Depression. And uh, times were very, very hard, as you would know. And this was a, 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 a marvellous opportunity for us to escape the, the, uh, the, the greyness of the Depression in Sydney and get up to uh, Harrington uh, at the mouth of the Manning River on the north coast. Blackfish always offered a way of getting a cheap feed. Uh, and through the depression when money was scarce, you could use very basic tackle, um, cheap little hooks, and you could make your sinkers out of sheet lead, um, and the bait was free. So it was a good way of feeding the family right through the depression. Everybody at Watson's Bay owned a blackfish rod. A place where a lot of blackfish were caught out at the Gap was a place where a lot of people jumped to their deaths in the desperation of those times. And I can remember passing queues outside Chatswood Town Hall, as I remember it. Each person would carry a billy. And they, in their turn, they would go to the head of the queue and receive a billy of soup and a, a piece of bread to take home to a family who definitely needed it. It was a very, very sad time and uh, uh, men who were unemployed would go black fishing uh, if they had a good bag because of the fact that you couldn't keep fish for any length of time. You were very, very fortunate if you were a neighbour of one of these very good black fishermen because there'd be two or three black fish passed over the back fence and they'd be very much appreciated. I met Dr. Bruce Daniel earlier this year at his house in Mudgee, a long way from the coast. And prior to going up there, I rang to arrange a meeting. And when I mentioned Blackfish, I could just about hear his eyes light up over the phone. Bruce preferred not to tell his story on tape, so he's asked me to tell his story for him. And his story is a very important one, because Bruce is a living witness to the days when people lived in rock caves in Sydney Harbour during the Depression. Now, Bruce first took up blackfishing in the 1950s. At the time, he was a medical student at the University of Sydney. And there he met another student by the name of Barry Pascoe. Now, Barry was a gun black fisherman, and of course he took his new friend Bruce fishing and taught him the ropes. Now, they fished all around Sydney Harbour. They fished at uh, Tamarama and Bondi. Uh, but one of their favourites was Grotto Point. And it was at Grotto Point that Bruce recalls meeting a chap by the name of Hungry Bill. According to Bruce, Hungry Bill was a second-generation cave dweller. Hungry Bill and his parents lived in the caves in Sydney Harbour around Grotto Point during the Depression. They caught fish and they sold fish, predominantly blackfish, to make a living. They'd go up to the streets, they'd go up to the corners, they'd go up to the pubs, the Manly pub in particular, and they'd sell their fish. And the working man would pick a fish for a couple of bob, take it home and cook it. Fresh fish, currency of the day. Plenty of people, some would be quite embarrassed, if I name them so I won't, who pay for uni fees and put themselves through courses and did all sorts of things by standing in pub corners and illegally selling blackfish for two bob or four bob each, depending on how big they were. Now Bruce and Barry, although it was a bit of a grey area, they would sell their fish on the streets as well. And Bruce recounts how he sold enough blackfish one day to buy a fancy new Rangoon cane rod. And not long after that he sold enough to buy the ultimate rod of the day, a split cane rod. Now Bruce recounts how Hungry Bill had the touch. He was a gun black fisherman, and like all good fishermen, Hungry Bill had secrets. He would never let you see how he put his bait on. He would never let you see his rig. He would walk around the corner and fish a different rock if the fish were biting just to make sure no one picked up on any of his secrets. And of course this is understandable. If you lived during the Depression and your survival depended upon your skills. You weren't going to tell other people how to go about it. And sadly, Barry Pascoe passed away quite early. But John Brown has a very interesting story to tell about Barry's passion for black fishing. One of my black fishing friends, who happened to be a doctor, was so enamoured of his reel, which he used over very, very many years, that uh, when he passed away, sadly, uh, fairly early in life, they put it in his coffin as a last gesture, and uh, which is a, f a, f 
fair indication of the degree of passion that people can, uh, can apply to this particular sport. But of course Bruce, who is now 88, is still black fishing and I recently caught up with him and a friend Peter Kentwell down at Womboyne and they were standing on the rocks, a little shaky on their pins, but with all the skills they'd learned half a century ago, pulling in blackfish for dinner. There is a myth about blackfish being unsuitable for eating or less suitable and uh, there is no substance in it. This confusion can be traced right back to the Barrow Boys who hawked their wares on the streets of Sydney in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Fish! Alive, alive, oh! Alive, alive, oh! Now that was the call that went out on the streets of Sydney. Now, fish alive meant fresh fish. Fresh being the operative word. Because right through the 1800s and into the 1900s, ice wasn't really an option. The Barrow Boys would get their supplies from the markets at Ullamaloo, and of course there was no ice there either. And the markets would get their fish from several sources. In the early days they would have caught blackfish in Sydney Harbour and had them on the market that day. And some people would have gone, hey, this is delicious. And for fishermen up on Tugra Lakes in the 1890s, they were complaining that it was hardly worth taking the blackfish to market because they couldn't even buy enough tobacco for the week. They got about two shillings for a couple of baskets. And of course, transport from Tuggera Lakes and other places such as Lake Illawarra could have taken up to two days. Now this was particularly relevant in the case of the blackfish because this is a fish that must be cleaned properly on capture for it to translate into an edible tablefish. Despite all this, blackfish have always been an incredibly important commercial fish. In fact, during the 1950s, a book written by fishing supremo T.C. Ruffley claims that the blackfish was the third most important commercial fish on the east coast of Australia. The blackfish fishery is in a relatively healthy state. Commercial landings have been variable but have averaged around 500 tonnes since the mid 40s. They're currently around 350 tonne. Overall, the, the lower value of um, blackfish in the market tends to constrain commercial landings. Blackfish are harvested commercially, predominantly for human consumption, as they really do provide a low-cost alternative for seafood consumers. We're catching blackfish at the moment uh, for an order that we have. We have a num number of shops that uh, place orders with us. They're cheap, sustainable protein uh, for the people who enjoy fresh local Australian seafood. It's not as trendy as a snapper or a barramundi or anything like that. We don't send the fish to Sydney because the freight costs are fairly substantial from the north coast and the, being a low price product, uh, people don't value them. Uh, the older people do because they grew up eating sea mullet and sea black and blackfish and uh, they're, they're a very good source of cheap protein. The proportion of um, blackfish in terms of quantity of total commercial landings is definitely still up there. Um, however, due to markets and consumer preferences and evolution of modern fishing technologies, it would have slipped a bit behind some of our other species, such as prawns, school whiting, um, the ubiquitous sea mullet and Australian sardines or pilchards. I've been commercial fishing for about 30 odd years. My father's pushing 87, 87. He's still doing a bit of commercial fishing. Uh, I learned pretty much everything from dad. Uh, his father fished, so probably third generation commercial fisherman on the Nambucca River. We've got some customers that have been coming here for 50 odd years buying blackfish. So they've told their friends and, it's, and the story spread and uh, lots of people buy them because basically they're uh, just a nice, mild, sweet, moist fish and they're not expensive. And a lot of the older people probably brought up during the Depression and things like that where their, their fathers actually caught blackfish for them when they were kids, so they, they know what blackfish is. So I think that's probably another reason why they do buy it as well. Because a lot of people can't go fishing, we're basically their agent. We catch their fish for them and we just catch what we need for the shop and uh, that way uh, all our sales are local and hopefully it's sustainable just supplying the local market. 
Yes, when the blackfish season starts and there's plenty around, we, we have 13 different size nets. So we just take the net which catches the nice big blackfish, which gives a nice size fillet, and uh, all the smaller fish go through and, and, and live for another day. It's quite a bit of a an art to catch blackfish and I think a lot of young people haven't got the patience uh, to, to learn or, or to try and attempt to catch blackfish. Bought some fish off Chris Davis. And I caught a couple here this morning. I'm going to cook them up and compare the flavour. I reckon they'll both be pretty good. Let's see how it tastes. Absolutely delicious. I think if there's any difference between Chris's fish, which was caught yesterday, flesh of the one I caught today is probably slightly firmer, but mm, they're both absolutely delicious. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. Wild caught fish, some of the best food we can get. Now when I think about the future of the blackfish fishery, there's one thing that comes to mind, and that's the fact that this fish schools up in very large numbers. And because of this, it's quite common for recreational fishermen to catch very large numbers of fish in any given session. Now the question is, is this catch rate sustainable? And are we managing it correctly? Uh, we have at times brought home as many as 300 fish which have gone into the freezer and every one of them has, uh, has featured on the, uh, on the family diet. And uh, There was a period where when we went to Wanboyne we worked out that the, with fish increasing in price that the quantity of fish that we brought home almost cut out the cost of the, the trip. The current bag limit for blackfish is 20, which is probably about twice as many as it should be. Any move to um, amend the bag limit for blackfish will be done as part of the review into the New South Wales bag and size limit for all species, and we're due to commence one later this year. Um, overall, the size limit was recently raised to assist in the sustainability of blackfish fishery. Uh, more specifically, it was done following quite um, specific research into blackfish biology, um, especially with regard to their length at sexual maturity. They're sexually mature, or half the population is sexually mature between around 20 and 27 centimetres. The numbers in Sydney Harbour are probably nearly as good as they've been in my lifetime, but the average size is small. You know, I used to catch plenty of fish over a kilo and a half, and quite a few over two, and even a few over two and a half kilos, you know, getting up with the five pound rate. And I say to them, and I haven't seen a fish like that for 20 years, I say, oh, your memory's gone. <laughs> Well, you know, your memory, yeah, you didn't really catch fish like that, but it did, and yeah, my memory hasn't gone. It's a great oral tradition of, uh, of spreading stories um, from uh, fathers to sons uh, through fishing. When the question is posed, I mean, the reason why I fish is because I fish with my dad. Now I do a very different type of fishing and, uh, uh, and that, but um, but there's a whole range of things that I know that I learnt pretty much subliminally. And a lot of older blokes in my life who, are, who once they find out that I, that I fish, and they'll tell you those stories. They're important stories. They're stories that you, you don't hear of anymore and stories that, are, um, that you wouldn't hear unless you'd mentioned fishing. In the unit that uh, I was attached to, it was my practice to sleep in a truck. And one day I found the truck had gone and it had been taken by General Blamey so they could, he could go on a fishing trip to uh, Shark Bay. And apparently General Blamey was very, very fond of fishing. 
very shortly on, I was on my way to Wanboyne and um, we arrived at this guest house and uh, we found that General Blamey had been there the previous month with his entourage and in fact had had the signalers bring nine miles of wire in off the Pacific Highway so he could keep in touch with the war. I can't stress how important it is for these traditions to be passed on to following generations. So this tradition of, of uh, taking up a sport, learning all its subtleties, uh, improving on it, uh, in my case have been handed on to my son Ross, uh, it's a, a very important part of his life. Someone once said, if you give someone a fish, you'll feed them once. But if you teach someone to fish, you'll feed them for a lifetime. And the lifetime feed will be more than just human sustenance. It'll be a feeding of the spirit. It provides a connection to nature, to a primeval self-sufficiency of hunters and gatherers, and also a connection across generations that will sustain relationships through thick and thin. And it is more important now than ever before, particularly as the pace of our lives accelerates out of control. Meat and fish have a backstory. Before they turn up on your plate, before they get wrapped in a cellophane wrapper at the fish shop or the meat shop, they were part of a bigger picture. The disconnect to this simple fact is rife in our community. With all fishing comes a connection back to a simple time, an understanding of what ecosystem actually means. And the humble blackfish that sustained workers and their families through the hardships of the depression that inhabits not only the estuaries and harbours of our populous east coast, but also the waterways of our minds. To sit and watch that float as it bobs on an endless ocean of tidal currents. As you wait for a fish to take it down, as the rush washes over you and a feed for the family beckons. That is the essence of the fisherman's journey, and that is the story of the ubiquitous blackfish.